activation domain normally. If there's a mutation, though, that affects the ability of the exons to recognize each other, so for example, maybe there's a change in this exon at the point in here, then when the cell is putting the whole thing together, it splices inappropriately and gives us a message that we don't, that the cell didn't expect. And we're going to see that in a little bit uh, more detail in a moment. So we're going back to exon 5. Now, what I've done in this slide is I've broken out the intronic sequence on the left-hand and right-hand side and broken and shaded exon 5 as a box. So the genomic sequence that gives rise to exon 5 is what is shaded in pink, the box, and the sequences that make that are just simply genomic sequence that don't contribute to the exons are shown here in these little bars for intron. If we look at the sequence now, and I have normal exon 5, you'll see that I have lowercase letters on the front, on the left hand and the rightmost side of our sequences that are in bold and caps. Also, I've denoted by a hash mark the difference between the lowercase sequence and the uppercase sequence. What I'm, what I'm showing you is the difference between intronic sequence and exonic sequence. And I've even broken the exons out into the triplets that it would normally read to make the protein. A splicing mutation occurs when a base change uh, either at the beginning or the end, so I've marked the end exon, the end of the exon, beginning of the intron, changes from a letter that the cell expects to a letter that the cell does not expect, in this case a T. What that does is it causes the cell to uh, not know that it needs to move to a different exon. And so in this slide, I'm showing you the junction between exons 4, 5, and 6. The CA that I just marked that is shown in blue marks the end of exon 5. The G that's right next to it marks the beginning of exon 6. In a splice junction mutation, if we have a T where the cell doesn't expect it, then it doesn't know that it should splice between splice out the intron between exons 5 and 6, and it treats all of the sequence in the middle as part of the protein. And so in this case, it adds a new T, and then it finds the next triplet, ACA, GCC, and there's our friendly stop codon TAG. What this does to the protein is it removes a Q that should have been there and everything else that comes after that. So the PAC6 protein that is now made has a new stop and it stops inappropriately and is no longer functional. And so if we step back to our diagrams that were taken from the BMC genetics review, we see that aniridia, and so let's pay, pay attention to B, uh, the pi diagram in B, aniridia is most often caused by nonsense mutations, frame shifting mutations that also give rise to, not, uh, to a break in the coding sequence and splicing mutations. We also find a fair number of run on mutations, and we'll get back to, get to the run on in just a second. So missense mutations are typically associated, so these are the mutations that change the coding sequence from one amino acid to another, but they don't necessarily stop the protein from being functional. It turns out, and I need to present them because we do find them. We do find them. The PAC6 missense mutation are associated with non-aneritic phenotypes. So this is an example of a missense mutation. In this case, we have our GAG, which encodes for an E. In this example, we have it changed to an A. 
So instead of this G, we now have an A, and so the amino acid changes from an E changes from to a K. To a K. Okay. So these types of mutations are most often associated with things that are called something other than aniridia. Um, I apologize, I didn't mean to leave Gillespie's and Axenfeld on. Uh, missense pac 6 mutations are most often associated with Peter's anomaly or some form of cataract, although there are other eye defects. Gillespie's, although there are some sporadic reports of pac 6 mutations associated with Gillespie's, um, the vast majority of cases that we know of so far are not due to PAC6 mutations. The same thing for axenfeld rigor but we'll talk about those two in a moment. So PAC6 missense mutations often give rise to Peters or cataracts or something that is usually not given a clinical diagnosis of aniridia. And so we're back to where we started. Over two-thirds of all aneurytic patients have a mutation that is going to affect the PAC, affect the PAC6 protein, usually by eliminating the protein altogether. So are there any questions? Hi, this is Carrie Hotel. Uh, I have a question about the mutations. Um, since you're able to identify there are six different mutations, is there a way to identify what types of side effects might come with those mutations, like the glaucoma and the cataracts and things like that? Okay, that's a really good question. And the answer is we can't determine it yet. Uh, we do know that certain types of mutations tend to be linked with more severe forms of PAC6. And so, for example, Mutations that fall at the 3' prime end of PAC6 or in these regions, in X and the regions I marked 11, 12, and 13, tend to be more severe, uh, whereas mutations that fall in this region, 6, 7, and 8, tend to be a little bit less severe, but it's a very small difference. Does that help answer your question, or do you need me to uh, go on? No, that's great, thank you. Okay. So, the question, and actually you just set me up perfectly. So, one of the questions is that what if you look for a PAC6 mutation in the coding region and you don't find, or we get a report back that says no PAC6 mutations were found. What most people think that means is that there is not a mutation in PAC6 and that's not necessarily true. So if we start playing with the question, what is the basis for aniridia in patients with a normal PAC6 coding region? And I mean, somebody's gone through and literally looked letter by letter and shown that all of the exons are normal. It could be that there's a mutation in one of these PAC6 regulatory sequences that normally controls whether the gene is on or off. A different possibility is that PAC6 has in fact been turned off the non-specific non, non position effects, and I'll come back to that one in a moment because that's, that's a hard one. The third possibility is that, in fact, there's a mutation in a different gene that also gives an aniridia phenotype, and I have aniridia in quotes because it cannot fully replicate aniridia. It has to be part of the aniridic phenotype, but not all of it, and I'll explain that when we get to the end of this. And if I forget, somebody asked me. So we know from work uh, by my lab and Veronica Van Hennigan's lab um, that PAC6 is, has a large number of control circuits that feed into it. So this is a complicated diagram. Um, the part of the gene that we've been looking at so far is over here. R is marked with an arrow. So here are our friends P0, P1, and P alpha. PAC6 gene that we've been looking at sort of spans from here to here. And now what I've done is I've opened now, up now. your view so that you can see it's as if we've stepped back, uh, it's as if we've gone up above the surface of the Earth several hundred miles. 
so we can see all of the landscape that goes from this side, the left side of PAC-6, to the right side of PAC-6. PAC-6 actually has, shares its space with another gene that we call L4. This gene is, runs opposite to PAC-6, so it starts on the right side and it ends over here at exon 10 on the left side. This gene is not involved in aniridia. We are very sure of this. But the reason I'm showing it to you is because it provides an important set of landmarks that allows us to define regions of the PAC-6 gene, which are in fact controlled. And so we know that there are regulatory elements distributed upstream of the gene, as it upstream, so uh, to the left of P0, to the left of P1, to the left of P alpha, we know that there are elements internal to the gene, which I just marked. And we now know that there are, in fact, really important regulatory elements located downstream of the gene, or what we call three prime of the gene. Some of these are marked as in box 1, 2, 3, SGL, and CMO. The, so this is going to be a little bit complicated, and I apologize. The important thing is that we know from work uh, that I did a few years ago, plus work in Veronica's Van Hennigan's lab, that chromosomal rearrangements are downstream of PAC-6, and so I've changed the diagram on you again. So now we just have a single promoter that's it's standing in for all promoters. The start of the gene is still to your left. The whole PAC-6 gene now is just denoted by this one box, and so all of the exons are denoted by that one box just for simplicity. We know that there are regulatory elements that are far away to the far away three prime or downstream of the gene that are absolutely required to turn PAC-6 on, six on in patients, and that's shown here. If this region is missing, even though these patients have a completely normal PAC-6 coding region, they still have aniridia. And so these are the regulatory elements that I've been talking about. So these are simply two examples from a study that I did. Um, the important thing here is that PAC-6 is shown down here. Oops, change my arrow direction. There we go. So PAC-6 is shown down here. The start of PAC-6 is far to your left, and what you're looking at is just the last little piece of it. So this is the last exon. There are two patients that we have been working with um, several years ago, case one and case two, that have perfectly normal PAC-6 coding regions. And so we went in and we looked at every single base of the PAC-6 coding region. Again, remember the region that makes protein and we determined that it was completely normal. There were no changes. But what was unique in these two individuals is that they both had deletions which fell three prime to the gene. And so if we come back to this slide, these are the deletions that would fall roughly in here between exon 13 and this region designated SGL. We now know that there are several mutations in PAC, several deletions in PAC-6, roughly denoted where the arrows are, that all affect, that all, I'm sorry, back up. There are deletions that map to all of these locations in patients with aniridia. Every single one of these cases has a normal PAC-6 coding region. And so what this tells us is that there are a roughly 10 to 20 percent of aniridic patients are going to have deletions that affect the ability of the PAC-6 gene to be turned on. 